the measure to block oversight. Additionally, the smith mont Act stipulates that USM services are meant to tell the American story abroad never to domestic audiences but the agency has used its taxpayer funding to promote partisan messaging in the U.S. One of the most egregious examples was when, in 2020, it bought ads on its foreign language social media sites to disseminate a bidden campaign ad and targeted it to a major Muslim population in Michigan. Point 42 Moreover, VOA often airs foreign adversaries' propaganda, which is antithetical to its congressionally mandated core mission. State Department oversight or command may be one way to ensure that VOA and the rest of the USM returns and adheres to its original mission. Clear lines of command and communications between the USM and an appropriate office of the National Security Council are also sorely lacking, as has been any reasonable accountability for USM senior leadership and strategy. The State Department's Assistant Secretary for Global Public Affairs and Under Secretary for Diplomacy and Public Affairs should also be in the accountability loop for agency actions. While the U.S. Secretary of State technically has a seat on the board of the agency, it is a toothless seat that is often deferred to the undersecretary and slash or assistant secretaries noted above. This position should be relevant and directive when U.S. foreign policy and strategic communications are at stake. For example, the years-long delay in confirming the Trump-appointed CEO left disastrous holdover leadership from the previous administration. Employing effective leadership, even in an acting capacity, while a new CEO is awaiting Senate confirmation is necessary to prevent a repeat of this behavior. L. Congress. The USM receives its budget and mandates directly from Congress. Often, changes in major functions at the agency happen because of the lobbying efforts of a few connected individuals often grantees lobbying for more funds and less accountability. Those changes can and do handcuff leadership from any meaningful oversight. An overhaul of the agency with review from Congress to modernize, streamline, and reduce waste must be done with congressional support. L. Key non-governmental stakeholders, allies, and non-allies. These include industry groups, non-profits, trade associations, foundations, and activist organizations, for example, America First Legal Foundation 43 Use and Watch 44 BBG Use and Watch 45 and Whistleblower Protection Project Point 46. Conclusion The USM is a story of a lost opportunity both to help restore the world's confidence in the promise and ideals of America and to set a high mark for journalistic integrity and unbiased reporting. These two areas have suffered severely under two decades of USM mismanagement and lack of oversight. Finding solutions to these problems and the restoration of the agency's networks must be the priorities of future agency leadership. To accomplish this, the USM must be fully reformed top to bottom with congressional and White House support. The possibility of consolidating not only the agency's subparts, but bringing the entire agency under the supervision of the NSC, the State Department, or both would dramatically aid that reform. If the de facto aim of the agency simply remains to compete in foreign markets using anti-U.S. talking points that parrot America's adversaries' propaganda, then this represents an unacceptable burden to the U.S. taxpayer and a negative return on investment. In that case, the USM should be defunded and disestablished. If, however, the agency can be reformed to become an effective tool, it would be one of the greatest tools in America's arsenal to tell America's story and promote freedom and democracy around the world. Authors note, the preparation of this chapter was a collective effort involving many individuals to whom thanks is owed. These individuals include, but are not limited to, Victoria Coates, Michael Pack, Frank Wilco, and several brave whistleblowers who prefer not to be named. Their efforts were integral to the chapter and are greatly appreciated. Corporation for Public Broadcasting Mike Gonzalez Every Republican president since Richard Nixon has tried to strip the corporation for public broadcasting, CPB, of taxpayer funding. That is significant not just because it means that for half a century, Republican presidents have failed to accomplish what they set out to do, but also because Nixon was the first president in office when National Public Radio, NPR, and the Public Broadcasting Service, PBS, which the CPB funds, went on air. In other words, all Republican presidents have recognized that public funding of domestic broadcasts is a mistake. As a 35-year-old lawyer in the Nixon White House, one Antonin Scalia warned that conservatives were being confronted with a long-range problem of significant social consequences that is, the development of a government-funded broadcast system similar to the BBC 47. All of which means that the next conservative president must finally get this done and do it despite opposition from congressional members of his own party if necessary. To stop public funding is good policy and good politics. The reason is simple. President Lyndon Johnson may have pledged in 1967 that public broadcasting would become a vital public resource to enrich our homes, educate our families and to provide assistance to our classrooms, 48 but public broadcasting immediately became a liberal forum for public affairs and journalism. Not only is the federal government trillions of dollars in debt and unable to afford the more than half a billion dollars squandered on leftist opinion each year, but the government should not be compelling the conservative half of the country to pay for the suppression of its own views. As Thomas Jefferson put it, to compel a man to furnish contributions of money for the propagations of opinions which he disbelieves and abhors, is sinful and tyrannical 49. A demonstrated pattern of bias. 
conservatives will thus reward a president who eliminates this tyrannical situation. PBS and NPR do not even bother to run programming that would attract conservatives. As Pew Research demonstrated in 2014, 25% of PBS's audience is mostly liberal, and 35% is consistently liberal. That is 60% liberal compared to 15% conservative, 11% mostly conservative and 4% consistently conservative, 0.50. NPR's audience is even to the left of that, with 67% liberal, 41% consistently liberal and 26% mostly liberal, compared with 12% conservative, 3% and 9% consistently conservative and mostly conservative. Respectively, 0.51 that may be an acceptable business model for MSNBC or CNN, but not for a taxpayer subsidized broadcaster. Defunding through the budgetary process. Cutting off the CPB is logistically easy. The solution lies in the budgetary process. In 2022, the CPB submitted to the Labor, Health and Human Services, Education, and Related Agencies Subcommittees of the House and Senate Appropriations Committees its budget justification for fiscal year, FI, 2023. In it, the CPB requested that Congress give it a $565 million advance appropriation a $40 million increase compared to its FI 2022 funding point 52 Unlike most other agencies, the CPB receives advance appropriations that provide them with funding two years ahead of time, which insulates the agency from Congress's power of the purse and oversight. This special budgetary treatment is unjustified and should be ended. The 47th president can just tell the Congress through the budget he proposes and through personal contact that he will not sign an appropriations spending bill that contains a penny for the CPB. The president may have to use the bully pulpit, as NPR and PBS have teams of lobbyists who have convinced enough members of Congress to save their bacon every time their taxpayer subsidies have been at risk since the Nixon era. Defunding CPB would by no means cause NPR or PBS or other public broadcasters that benefit from CPB funding, including the even further to the left Pacifica Radio and American public media to file for bankruptcy. The membership model that the CPB uses, along with the funding from corporations and foundations that it also receives, would allow these broadcasters to continue to thrive. As George Will wrote, if Sesame Street programming were put up for auction, the danger would be of getting trampled by the stampede of potential bidders 53 indeed, Sesame Street is on HBO now, which shows its potential as a money earner. Public interest vs privilege. Stripping public funding would, of course, mean that NPR, PBS, Pacifica Radio and the other leftist broadcasters would be shorn of the presumption that they act in the public interest and receive the privileges that often accompany so acting. They should no longer, for example, be qualified as non-commercial education stations. NCE stations, which they clearly no longer are. NPR, Pacifica and the other radio ventures have zero claim on an educational function, the original purpose for which they were created by President Johnson, and the percentage of on-air programming that PBS devotes to educational endeavors such as Sesame Street, programs that are themselves biased to the left, is small. Being an NCE comes with benefits. The Federal Communications Commission, for example, reserves the 20 stations at the lower end of the radio frequency, between 88 and 108 MHz on the FM band, for NCEs. The FCC says that only non-commercial educational radio stations are licensed in the 88-92 MHz reserved band, while both commercial and non-commercial educational stations may operate in the non-reserved band. Point 54 This confers advantages, as lower frequency stations can be heard farther away and are easier to find as they lie on the left end of the radio dial, figuratively as well as ideologically. The FCC also exempts NCE stations from licensing fees. It says that non-commercial educational NCE FM station licensees and full-service NCE television broadcast station licensees are exempt from paying regulatory fees, provided that these stations operate solely on an NCE basis. 55. NPR and PBS stations are in reality no longer non-commercial, as they run ads in everything but name for their sponsors. They are also non-educational. The next president should instruct the FCC to exclude the stations affiliated with PBS and NPR from the NCE denomination and the privileges that come with it. End notes. One U.S. Agency for Global Media, https slash slash www.usim.gov slash, accessed March 20, 2023. Two Ben Wine Garden, Security Failures USG Media Agency Prove Need to Hire Americans First, Newsweek, August 10, 2020, https slash slash www.newsweek.com slash Security Failures USG Media Agency Prove Need Hire Americans First Opinion 1523895, accessed March 20, 2023. 3 U.S. Agency for Global Media, Who We Are, https slash slash www.usim.gov slash who we are slash history slash, accessed March 20, 2023. 4 U.S. Agency for Global Media, Voice of America, https slash slash www.usim.gov slash network slash voa slash, accessed March 20, 2023.
5. Daniel Lipman, deleted bitten video sets off a crisis at Voice of America, Politico July 30, 2020, https slash slash www.politico.com slash news slash 2020 slash 07 slash 30 slash deleted bitten video sets off a crisis at Voice of America 388571, accessed March 20, 2023. 6. U.S. Agency for Global Media, Office of Cuba Broadcasting, https slash slash www.usim.gov slash networks slash OCB slash, accessed March 20, 2023. 7. Rafael Bernal, Bipartisan Group Asks Office of Cuba Broadcasting to Rescind Layoffs, September 13, 2022, The Hill, https slash slash thehill.com slash latino slash 3641445 Bipartisan Group Asks Office of Cuba Broadcasting to Rescind Layoffs slash, accessed March 20, 2023. 8. U.S. Agency for Global Media, Middle East Broadcasting Networks, https slash slash www.usim.gov slash networks slash mbn slash, accessed March 20, 2023. 9. U.S. Agency for Global Media, Consolidation Report, P13, https slash slash docs.house.gov slash meeting slash fa slash fa 00 slash 20210930 slash 114085 slash hmkp 117 fa 00 2021093 sd 002.pdf, accessed March 22, 2023. 10. U.S. Agency for Global Media, Radio Free Asia https slash slash www.usim.gov slash networks slash rufus slash, accessed March 20, 2023. 11 U.S. Department of State and the Broadcasting Board of Governors, Office of the Inspector General, Audit of Radio Free Asia Expenditures, June 2015, https slash slash www.statioid.gov slash upload slash report slash report underscore pdf underscore file slash audfmib 15-24 underscore 1.pdf, Accessed March 22, 2023. 12 Ibid. 13 Ibid, P16. 14 Susan Crabtree, Lax Internet Freedom Group Box at New Pack Oversight, https slash slash www.illclearpolitics.com slash article slash 2020 slash 08 slash 24 slash lax underscore internet underscore freedom underscore group underscore box underscore at underscore new underscore pack underscore oversight underscore 144043.html. Accessed March 22, 2023. 15 Ibid. 16 Ibid. 17 Nomination of Michael Pack to the Broadcasting Board of Governors, 116th CONG, 2nd Session, 2020, https slash slash www.congress.gov slash nomination slash 116th Congress slash 1590, accessed March 20, 2023. 18 James Robbins, More Rod at America's Public Diplomacy Mouthpiece, The Hill, November 7, 2020. HTTPS slash slash thehill.com slash opinion slash national security slash 524924 more rod at America's public diplomacy mouthpiece slash accessed March 20th, 2023. 19 U.S. Office of Personnel Management, Suitability Agency Executive Programs, Follow up review of U.S. Agency for Global Media, July 2020. HTTPS slash slash beepwatch.com slash WP content slash upload slash 2020 slash 08 slash OPM suit EA July 2020. PDF. Accessed March 20, 203. 20. If the agency were not an extension of U.S. foreign policy and national security goals, then its staffing positions would not be classified in their entirety as Tier 3 and Tier 5 national security sensitive positions, which they are. See U.S. Agency for Global Media, Consolidation Report, P13. 21. Federal Register, Volume 85, Number 115, June 15, 2020, pages 36,150 36,153. 22 U.S. Information and Educational Exchange Act of 1948, smith munt Act, Public Law 8402. 23 Jessica Geriat, USM CEO criticized over move to rescind firewall regulation, October 28, 2020, https slash slash www.vonews.com slash a slash USA underscore USM CEO criticized over move rescind firewall regulation slash 6197671.html, accessed March 20, 2023. 24 Byron York. America's Lost Voice, Washington Examiner, February 4, 2021, https slash slash www.washingtonexaminer.com slash politics slash America's Lost Voice, accessed March 20, 2023. 25 Sasha Gong, VOA Problems, Racism, Xenophobia, Mediocrity and Nepotism, BBG Use and Watch, December 25, 2018. Archived at https slash slash web dot archive dot org slash web slash two zero two two zero one zero five one zero one three zero zero slash https slash slash beepwatch dot com slash beepwatch slash voa problems racism xenophobia mediocrity and nepotism slash 
accessed March 20, 2023. 26 U.S. Agency for Global Media Watch, Big Mistake in Rewarding Failed Voice of America, VOA, Managers U.S. Agency for Global Media Managers, November 11, 2022. HTTPS slash slash www.usagewatch.com slash big mistake in rewarding failed voice of America VOA and US Agency for Global Media Usum Managers slash accessed March 20th, 2023. 27 America First Legal Foundation, AFL asks Biden administration to withdraw nomination of Amanda Bennett citing national security and related failures, June 30th, 2022. HTTPS slash slash aflegal.org slash AFL asks Biden administration to withdraw nomination of Amanda Bennett citing national security and related failures slash accessed March 20, 2023. 28 U.S. Agency for Global Media, Consolidation Report, P13. 29 U.S. Agency for Global Media Watch, Extraordinary Leadership Dysfunction at USM Continues, October 4, 2022, HTTPS slash slash www.usagewatch.com slash Extraordinary Leadership Dysfunction at USM Continues slash, accessed March 20, 2023. 30 U.S. Office of Personnel Management, Follow-up review of the U.S. Agency for Global Media Suitability Program. 31 IBID. 32 U.S. Agency for Global Media, Consolidation Report, P13. 33 U.S. Office of Personnel Management, Follow-up review of the U.S. Agency for Global Media Suitability Program. 34 Robbins, More Rot at America's Public Diplomacy Mouthpiece. 35 U.S. Department of Justice, Manhattan U.S. Attorney Announces Kidnapping Conspiracy Charges Against an Iranian Intelligence Officer and Members of an Iranian Intelligence Network. July 13, 2021, https slash slash www.justice.gov slash usaosdny slash pr slash Manhattan US Attorney announces kidnapping conspiracy charges against Iranian, accessed March 20, 2023. 36 James Robbins, The Trouble with the Open Technology Fund, Newsweek, August 9, 2020, https slash slash www.newsweek.com slash trouble open technology fund opinion 1528998, accessed March 20, 2023. 37 Susan Crabtree, Lax Internet Freedom Group Box at New PAC Oversight, Real Clear Politics, August 24, 2020, https slash slash www.illclearpolitics.com slash article slash 2020 slash 08 slash 24 slash lax underscore internet underscore freedom underscore group underscore box underscore at underscore new underscore pack underscore oversight underscore 144043.html, accessed March 20, 2023. 38 U.S. Department of State, Visas for members of the foreign media, press, and radio, https slash slash travel.state.gov slash content slash travel slash and slash us visas slash employment slash visas members foreign media press radio.html, accessed March 20, 2023. 39 authorized positions for J1 visas include, au pair, camp counselor, college slash university student, government visitor, intern, international visitor, physician, professor, research scholar, secondary school student, short-term scholar, Specialist, STEM Initiatives, Summer Work Travel, Teacher and Trainee. See U.S. Department of State, Exchange Visitor Visa, HTTPS slash slash travel dot state dot gov slash content slash travel slash and slash us visas slash study slash exchange dot html, accessed March 20, 2023. 40 News Release, McCall Demands Answers on USM Personnel and Management, Foreign Affairs Committee, October 28, 2021. HTTPS slash slash foreign affairs dot house dot gov slash press release slash McCall demands answers on using personnel and management slash accessed March 20th, 2023. 41 U.S. Agency for Global Media Watch, USM, past leaders ignored national security procedures, failed to adequately vet staff, August 8, 2020. HTTPS slash slash www.usagewatch.com slash USM past agency leaders ignored national security procedures, failed to adequately vet staff slash accessed March 20th, 2023. 42 U.S. Agency for Global Media, CEO PAC launches investigation into pro VOA content, U.S. election interference, July 30, 2020, HTTPS slash slash www.usm.gov slash 2020 slash 07 slash 30 slash CEO PAC launches investigation into pro VOA content U.S. election interference slash, accessed March 22, 2023. 43 America First Legal Foundation, AFL asks Biden administration to withdraw nomination of Amanda Bennett citing national security and related failures, June 30, 2022, HTTPS slash slash aflegal.org slash AFL asks Biden administration to withdraw nomination of Amanda Bennett citing national security and related failures slash, accessed March 20, 2023. 44 U.S. Agency for Global Media Watch, HTTPS slash slash www.usagewatch.com slash, accessed March 20, 2023. 45 BBG USAM Watch, 
https slash slash beepwatch.com slash beepwatch slash accessed March 20th, 2023. 46 Whistleblower Protection Project, Congress releases long-awaited investigative report on chronically mismanaged USM, February 9, 2022. HTTPS slash slash whipproj.org slash Congress releases long awaited USM investigative report revealing agencies chronic mismanagement slash accessed March 20th, 2023. 47 National Telecommunications and Information Administration, Nixon Administration Public Broadcasting Papers, Summary of 1971, February 23rd, 1979, HTTPS slash slash current.org slash 1979 slash 02 slash Nixon Administration Public Broadcasting Papers, Summary of 1971 slash Accessed March 21, 2023. 48 President Lyndon B. Johnson, State of the Union Address, January 10, 1967, https slash slash www.infoplease.com slash primary sources slash government slash presidential speeches slash State Union Address Lyndon B. Johnson January 10 1967, accessed March 21, 2023. 49 Joyce Appleby and Terence Ball, eds, Jefferson, Political Writings, Cambridge and New York. Cambridge University Press, 1999, p. 390. 50 Pew Research Center, Where News Audiences Fit on the Political Spectrum, October 21, 2014, http colon slash slash www.journalism.org slash interactive slash media hyphen polarization slash outlet slash pbs, accessed March 21, 2023. 51 IBID. 52 Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Corporation for Public Broadcasting Appropriation Request and Justification FI 2023 FI 2025, submitted to the Labor, Health and Human Services, Education and Related Agencies Subcommittee of the House Appropriations Committee and the Labor, Health and Human Services, Education and Related Agencies Subcommittee of the Senate Appropriations Committee, March 28, 2022, P2, https//www.cpb.org slash site slash default slash file slash appropriation slash FI 2023-2025 CPB budget. Justification.pdf, accessed March 21, 2023. 53 George F. Will, Public Broadcasting's Immortality Defies Reason, The Washington Post, June 2, 2017. HTTPS slash slash www.washingtonpost.com slash opinions slash public broadcasting's immortality defies reason slash 2017 slash 06 slash 02 slash F5 to 02 B46 FE117A196A1BB629 F64CB underscore story dot HTML, UTM underscore term equals point eight df 301 f 6 ca 6 accessed March 21st, 2023. 54 Federal Communications Commission, FM Radio. HTTPS slash slash www.fcc.gov slash general slash FM radio, accessed March 21st, 2023. 55 Federal Communications Commission, Regulatory Fee Exemptions for FI 2021, FCC Regulatory Fees Fact Sheet No. De 21 1142, September 10, 2021, P2. Warning, Empty Page. 9. Agency for International Development. Max Prime Orac. Mission. The U.S. Agency for International Development leads the U.S. government's international development and disaster assistance programs. USAID helps communities to lead their own development journeys by reducing the impact of conflict, preventing hunger and the spread of pandemic disease, and counteracting the drivers of violence, instability, transnational crime, and other threats. In alignment with U.S. national security interests, the agency promotes American prosperity through initiatives that expand markets for U.S. exports, encourage innovation, create a level playing field for U.S. businesses, and support more stable, resilient, and democratic societies that are less likely to act against American interests and more likely to respect family, life, and religious liberty. Overview USAID was established during the presidency of John F. Kennedy pursuant to the Foreign Assistance Act of 19611 to promote the foreign policy, security, and national interests of the United States. At the height of the Cold War with the Soviet Union, it sought to halt the spread of communism by assisting peoples in the developing world in their efforts to advance economically, socially, and politically. The agency helped to transition Central and Eastern Europe from socialism to free market-based democracies. Today, USAID leads the U.S. government's global development and humanitarian disaster assistance responses. Over the years, USAID expanded the number of countries assisted, the scope and size of its activities, and especially its budget. The Trump administration faced an institution marred by bureaucratic inertia, programmatic incoherence, wasteful spending, and dependence on huge awards to a selfing and politicized aid industrial complex of United Nations agencies, international non-governmental organizations, NGOs, and for-profit contractors. Once started, 
programs continue almost indefinitely in many countries, for decades. USAID's multi-billion dollar humanitarian programs that were once 80% in response to natural disasters are now 80% in response to violent, man-made crises and have become a permanent and immiserating feature of the global landscape. Under the Trump administration, USAID focused on ending the need for foreign aid by placing countries onto a journey to self-reliance. Point two, the administration restructured the agency to reflect this strategic approach to development, streamlined procurement procedures to diversify its partner base, increased awards to cost-effective local, including faith-based organizations, and improved internal governance. It instituted pro-life and family-friendly policies. It promoted international religious freedom as a pillar of the agency's work and built up an unprecedented genocide response infrastructure. The Biden administration has deformed the agency by treating it as a global platform to pursue overseas a divisive political and cultural agenda that promotes abortion, climate extremism, gender radicalism, and interventions against perceived systemic racism. It has dispensed with decades of bipartisan consensus on foreign aid and pursued policies that contravene basic American values and have antagonized our partners in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. It has decoupled U.S. assistance from free market reforms that are the keystone of economic and political stability and has teamed with global institutions to impose central planning diktats on an unprecedented scale. Wasteful budget increases requested by the administration and appropriated by Congress have outstripped USAID's capacity to spend funds responsibly, and U.S. foreign aid has been transformed into a massive and open-ended global entitlement program captured by and enriching the progressive left. The next conservative administration should scale back USAID's global footprint. By, at a minimum, returning to the agency's 2019 pre-COVID-19 pandemic budget level. It should de-radicalize USAID's programs and structures and build on the conservative reforms instituted by the Trump administration. This will require working closely with the U.S. Congress to make deep cuts in the international Affairs 150 account while granting USAID greater flexibility in spending its appropriated funds to achieve better developmental outcomes. Key Issues Aligning U.S. Foreign Aid to U.S. Foreign Policy U.S. Foreign Aid is too often disconnected from the strategy and practice of U.S. Foreign Policy. Its coordination is made difficult as the aid budget is divided among approximately 20 offices, agencies, and departments that provide some form of foreign assistance. The USAID Administrator should be authorized to take on the additional role of Director of Foreign Assistance, DFA, with the rank of Deputy Secretary at the Department of State in charge of all U.S. foreign assistance. The DFA role would empower this person to align and coordinate the countless foreign assistance programs across the U.S. government and carry out the agenda of the next conservative president more effectively. A version of this role existed during the last two years of the George W. Bush administration, but the Obama administration eliminated it in 2009. Countering China's Development Challenge Through its trillion-dollar Belt and Road Initiative, BRI, the People's Republic of China, PRC, has directed billions of dollars in loans and investments to advance its geostrategic objective of displacing the United States as the premier global power. The PRC leverages its transactions termed debt traps by many critics to strengthen its global influence, extract natural resources, isolate Taiwan, win political support at international fora, and access ports and bases for its military. In Latin America, 25 of 29 countries participate in the BRI, and the PRC ranks as the region's largest trading partner. Since 2005, Chinese state-owned banks have issued $138 billion in loans to Latin American countries, and other Chinese entities have invested an additional $140 billion. In Africa, China has issued $160 billion in loans and dominates the continent's rare earth mining sector, which is critical to global energy development. The World Bank estimates that 60% of all BRI loans are in financial distress, leading many countries to seek emergency financial help from Western donors. Chinese-funded projects are known for employing substandard labor and environmental practices, fueling corruption, promoting wasteful financial decisions by governments, advancing China's geostrategic interests, and creating an unequal trade relationship in which China secures raw materials from developing countries and sells those countries' manufacturing products. For example, Brazil, a world leader in chew production, saw its industry collapse under a flood of cheap Chinese imports. China's mercantilist penetration of the developing world and the negative consequences for developing countries' healthy economic growth have undercut U.S. strategic relationships in those countries and wasted billions in U.S. foreign aid. During the Trump administration, USAID L inaugurated a robust counter-China response called Clear Choice 3 that contrasted America's development approach based on liberty, sovereignty, and free markets with China's mercantilist authoritarianism that pursued predatory financing schemes and economic and political subordination to Beijing. L launched its first digital strategy for to promote safe 5G access in emerging markets and combat Beijing's efforts to equip regimes with tools to stifle democracy. L struck bilateral development relationships with Japan, Israel, Kuwait, Qatar, the United Arab Emirates, and Taiwan to support projects in Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, Latin America, and the Middle East. 
L established an office in Greenland to help counter China's claims of being a near-Arctic state and reoriented its programming across Asia including establishing a USAID mission to Central Asia in line with America's Indo-Pacific strategy. Point five. L joined with the U.S. Department of Homeland Security and National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration to help coastal countries detect and halt illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing and confront criminal activities practiced by state-run Chinese fishing fleets that violate international norms, ravage fishing industries in developing countries, worsen food insecurity, rob vulnerable communities of their livelihoods, and deplete maritime resources. USAID built an organizational infrastructure to carry out its multiple lines of counter-China operations. An agency-wide Clear Choice Executive Council and USAID US International Development Finance Corporation Working Group reviewed all proposed assistance programs and proposals through a counter-China lens. A senior executive-level Clear Choice Coordinator, reporting to the administrator, advised the agency's leadership on initiatives to counter China, supported by a fully dedicated six-person secretariat. The Biden administration discontinued these programs and allowed USAID's counter-China architecture to waste away subordinating our national security interests to progressive climate politics in which communist China is viewed as a global partner. The next conservative administration should restore and build on the Trump administration's counter-China infrastructure at USAID, and the climate policy fanaticism that advantages Beijing, and assess bilateral aid through the lens of U.S. national security interests, rewarding those countries that resist China's debt diplomacy. It should finance programs designed to counter specific Chinese efforts in strategically important countries and eliminate funding to any partner that engages with Chinese entities directly or indirectly. USAID's Bangkok-based Regional Development Mission for Asia should focus its strategic attention on supporting cross-border initiatives designed to counter Chinese influence. Climate Change Upon taking office, President Biden issued executive orders to put the climate crisis at the center of U.S. foreign policy and national security and mitigate the devastating inequalities that intersect with gender, race, ethnicity and economic security. 6. USAID subsequently declared itself a climate agency and redirected its private sector engagement strategy teaming with America's corporate sector to wean countries off foreign aid through private investment and trade to support the administration's global policy to transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy. The administration has incorporated its radical climate policy into every USAID initiative. It has joined or funded international partnerships dedicated to advancing the aims of the Paris Climate Agreement and has supported the idea of giving trillions of dollars more in aid transfers for climate reparations. The Biden administration's extreme climate policies have worsened global food insecurity and hunger. Its anti-fossil fuel agenda has led to a sharp spike in global energy prices. Inflation has hit the poor the hardest as they expend a higher proportion of income on food purchases. Farmers in poor countries can no longer afford to buy expensive natural gas-based fertilizers that are key to achieving high yields of food production. Under advice from climate radicals, the government of Sri Lanka even banned chemical fertilizers entirely without having any replacements in place. The result has been hunger and violent political instability. The aid industry claims that climate change causes poverty, which is false. Enduring conflict, government corruption, and bad economic policies are the main drivers of global poverty. USAID's response to man-made food insecurity is to provide more billions of dollars in aid a recipe that will keep scores of poor countries underdeveloped and dependent on foreign aid for years to come. The impact on Africa is especially acute. South Africa, for example, relies on coal-powered plants to generate 80% of its power needs. It would need $26 billion in foreign aid to make the full transition away from coal. Multiplying this amount by dozens of other countries on the continent, the financial resources needed to transition away from fossil fuels are unachievable. In Latin America, countries that are global leaders in oil and gas production have sharply curtailed their energy production in line with climate activists upending the hemisphere's major source of export revenues and condemning it to years of economic and political instability. USAID should cease its war on fossil fuels in the developing world and support the responsible management of oil and gas reserves as the quickest way to end wrenching poverty and the need for open-ended foreign aid. The next conservative administration should rescind all climate policies from its foreign aid programs, specifically USAID's Climate Strategy 2022-2307 shut down the agency's offices, programs, and directives designed to advance the Paris Climate Agreement, and narrowly limit funding to traditional climate mitigation efforts. USAID resources are best deployed to strengthen the resilience of countries that are most vulnerable to climatic shifts. The agency should cease collaborating with and funding progressive foundations, corporations, international institutions, and NGOs that advocate on behalf of climate fanaticism, diversity, equity, and inclusion agenda. USAID installed Advisors on Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion DEI, committees in all its bureaus, offices, and overseas missions and created an agency-wide dashboard and DEI scorecard for all bureaus, offices, and missions to track staff compliance with the administration's DEI directives. A chief DEI officer oversees this DEI infrastructure and sits in the administrator's office. 
DEI directives are now part of all agency policies and are incorporated as standard clauses in all contract and grant awards. Those seeking to do business with the agency must describe the approaches they will use to diversify their partner base. 8 USAID often ties DEI to gender and climate equity, corrupting every aspect of the agency's overseas work. The upshot has been to racialize the agency and create a hostile work environment. For anyone who disagrees with the Biden administration's identity politics, this pursuit of ideological purity threatens merit based professional advancement for staff who do not overtly conform, hyper politicizes what should be a nonpartisan federal workplace environment, creates an institutionalized cadre of progressive political commissars, corrupts the award process, and discourages potential contractors. And grantees that disagree with this radical agenda from applying for USAID funding. The next conservative administration should dismantle USAID's DEI apparatus by eliminating the chief diversity officer position along with the DEI advisors and committees, cancel the DEI scorecard and dashboard, remove DEI requirements from contract and grant tenders and awards, issue a directive to cease promotion of the DEI agenda, including the bullying LGBTQ and agenda, and provide staff a confidential medium through which to adjudicate cases of political retaliation that agency or implementing staff suffered during the Biden administration. It should eliminate funding for partners that promote discriminatory DEI practices and consider debarment in egregious cases. As federal departments and agencies cannot play partisan politics, staff irrespective of hiring mechanism as well as implementers and grantees that engage in ideological agitation on behalf of the DEI agenda should be dismissed, and entities should be debarred. The next conservative administration should return the authority over all civil rights issues at USAID to the agency's Office of Civil Rights, which is the appropriate locus for ensuring that all Americans have guaranteed.